Good morning, everyone. For 75 years, the NHS has existed for an enduring moral purpose, to give every single person in our country the security that comes from knowing that if you're sick, you will be cared for. Rich or poor, young or old, in work or out, the NHS is there for you, whenever and wherever you need it. I believe in the NHS because it's fundamental to my family. My dad was a GP. My mum was a pharmacist. And I saw from an early age the difference they made to the community where they lived and worked, and the difference made by the hundreds of thousands of others who sacrificed so much for so many in the service of that higher purpose of protecting our nation's health. But while that purpose has never changed, what has changed are the challenges facing the NHS. Our society is growing older. The burden of illness is changing. And all of this will put pressure on an already overstretched workforce. A couple of weeks ago, I joined doctors and nurses on the late shift at Watford General Hospital. I saw courageous, hardworking men and women doing extraordinary things in difficult circumstances. And they told me the same message we hear time and time again from leaders in the healthcare sector and the public. We need more doctors and nurses to ease the pressures. And we need reform to free them up to do their jobs properly. And they're right. Governments from all parties have ducked the challenge for decades. It just isn't right that we don't train enough people here at home to properly staff our national health service. Now, overcoming this won't be quick or easy. It's only possible because of the difficult decisions we're taking elsewhere to cut the debt. And by prioritizing the NHS, there will be other things that we can't afford. But the NHS is too important. So we're making the tough calls and doing things differently to protect the long-term future of the NHS and this country. Already, we've made progress with more investment in the NHS than any government before, including up to 14 billion pounds extra for health and social care over the next two years. We've not only hit our manifesto target to recruit 26,000 more primary care staff, we've done so one year early. And we're very close to meeting our promise to recruit 50,000 more nurses. And we're cutting the waiting lists, with waits of over two years virtually eliminated in England and the number of patients waiting over 18 months reduced by over 90%. But even without the COVID backlogs, and even with the record number of doctors and nurses we have today, unless we act now for the long term, the challenges we face will only get worse. So today, we're announcing the most ambitious transformation in the way that we staff the NHS in its history the long-term workforce plan. This is a 15-year plan to deliver the biggest ever expansion in the number of doctors and nurses that we train, and a plan to reform the NHS so we deliver better care in a changing world, and a plan that not only eases the pressures today, but protects this precious national institution for the long term. This is the NHS's own plan and the government is proud to back it. Funding the expansion of education and training for the first five years in full, with over 2.4 billion pounds of additional investment. You can trust this government with the NHS. The plan rests on three principles, train, retain, and reform. First, training. will double the number of medical training places by 2031 focusing on areas where there are too few doctors today. We'll train over 24,000 more nurses and midwives a year and increase the number of GP training places by 50%. In time, this will allow us to reduce our spending on temporary agency staff by 10 billion pounds and cut the need for international recruitment. Today, the proportion recruited from overseas is around one in four. With our plan, it will fall to just one in 10. Second, doctors and other clinicians can spend a lifetime gaining invaluable experience. We want to hang on to those skills for as long as we can 
so we'll retain more of our dedicated workforce, keeping up to 130,000 more staff in the NHS over the next 15 years. We already offer best-in-class pensions, and we've just dramatically cut the tax on pension savings, a move that has been called transformative. Now we're going to modernise the pension scheme so staff can partially retire or return to work much more easily if they wish to. And we're going to improve conditions right now for those who gave so much during the pandemic. To do that, we're improving culture, leadership and well-being, giving staff more flexibility and control and investing in their professional development. Finally, we need reform. It's not enough just to have more doctors and nurses. We need to change the way they work so that they can deliver better care for patients. Now, partly this is about seizing the opportunities of new technologies like AI, or just look at virtual wards, which use technology to allow patients to recover at home, providing a better service at lower cost. But we're also going to expand new roles like nurse associates and physician associates so that the most qualified staff can focus, focus on patients with the most complex needs. We're going to drive the biggest ever expansion of apprenticeships in the NHS so that one fifth of all clinical training will be offered through degree apprenticeships, helping to bring staff into the NHS from a much wider range of backgrounds and will give staff in the NHS more opportunities to progress, such as becoming a nurse or a doctor, as well as making sure that the workforce of the future has the advanced knowledge they need to care for our ageing population. Now, taken together, these changes will raise NHS productivity so patients get more and better care for the same money. So, training, retention and reform. That's our plan to build the healthcare workforce of the future and secure the NHS for the long term. Next week marks the 75th anniversary of the NHS. For every minute of every day of every one of those 75 years, the NHS has been kept going by the millions of people that have worked for it. To them, on behalf of a grateful nation, I want to say thank you. I feel a powerful sense of responsibility to make sure that their legacy endures and to make sure that the NHS is there for our children and grandchildren, just as it was there for us. And that's what today's plan is all about. More doctors, more nurses, better care for all today and long into the future. Thank you. I'm just going to hand over to Amanda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. So it's a real pleasure to be with you here at the launch of the first ever NHS long-term workforce plan. As the Prime Minister has just said, the health service reaches a major milestone next week, the 75th anniversary of our founding. The publication of this ambitious and bold NHS plan feels, however, an even more significant moment than that anniversary, because it's the first time since 1948 that we have been asked by government to produce a long-term comprehensive assessment of our staffing needs and a plan to deliver them. So I would like to thank the Prime Minister and the Chancellor for wholeheartedly backing the plan and kick-starting delivery with significant investment that will fully fund record numbers of training places for doctors, for nurses and for other staff needed over the next five years. This is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to improve patient care by putting staffing on a sustainable footing. And I would like just to take this moment to thank all of my colleagues across the NHS and beyond who have worked so hard with us uh, to produce it. Your input has been invaluable. The NHS can do nothing without its staff. The last few years in particular have shown, I think, again, just the brilliance of our staff, caring for over a million people with COVID in hospitals, delivering the biggest vaccination programme in our history, dealing with the busiest winter on record, as well as making progress on backlogs and on cancer diagnoses. However, we already have 
112,000 vacancies and as we know our population is going to grow, it's going to age and as new treatments and therapies come online the demands on the NHS and on our, own, on our workforce are only going to increase. Since the foundation of the NHS we've relied on the skills and dedication of staff who came here from the four corners of the globe to care for patients and there will always be a place for them in the NHS. But demand for healthcare workers is increasing and will continue increasing across the world. So doing nothing is not an option. And as the Prime Minister says, we're not going to do nothing. Instead, we are going to do the boldest set of changes for workforce ever in the history of the NHS. We will increase the number of homegrown doctors, nurses, and other staff as part of the biggest workforce expansion in our history. And we will draw on the widest possible pool of talent by expanding new routes into the profession so more people can get a nursing or a medical degree without going to university full time. But recruitment is only part of the answer. We will also retain more of the staff we have and reform the way that they train and work so we're making the most of everyone's education, skills and experience better opportunities for career development, improving flexible working options alongside government reforms to the pension scheme should mean around 130,000 more staff stay working in NHS settings longer. Changes in technology and new treatments will change the way we work in future, as well as the numbers and the roles that are needed in the future. So from care closer to home with medicines available on the high street and more staff receiving training to spot early signs of cardiovascular disease, cancer and stroke, through to those colleagues working in virtual wards and beyond, this plan is not just good news for NHS staff, it is good news for patients too. And this plan will be regularly updated to ensure we stay on track to deliver the workforce we need to deliver the best possible care now and into the future. Working in the NHS is not always easy, as the last few years in particular have shown, but it does offer a huge variety of careers with more than 350 different roles within the NHS. So I would like to close by urging anyone thinking about making a change in their career or at school or university thinking about what to do next to consider an opportunity for a career in the NHS. Thank you, Amanda. Well, brilliant to hear from the CEO of the NHS. We're now going to hear from Steve Powers, the NHS Medical Director. Steve, over to you. Thank you, Prime, uh, Prime Minister. So, uh, as Amanda has said, this is a very important uh, day indeed, an historic day for the NHS, for all who work in it, and of course, for the patients that we all care for. I know it takes a team to care for a patient, so not just doctors like me, but nurses, physios, therapists, porters, cleaners, the list goes on. So growing the workforce will help to ensure that that team have the time they need to give the standard of care that they want to provide and that they've been trained to give. We also have the opportunity to recruit, train and work differently in a way that is both rewarding for staff and also more productive for patients and for the country. So like the Prime Minister and like Amanda, I really truly believe this is a landmark day for the NHS just ahead of our 75th anniversary. And it's a landmark day for all who are employed within the NHS and, of course, most of all, for those that we care for. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, would you like to take some questions from the media? Can we start with the BBC, please? Thank you, Prime Minister. Hugh Pym, BBC News. Work on this plan was at least underway early last year. Why has it taken so long? to get it launched and have you lost valuable time there? And a quick second one, Lord Goldsmith has resigned this morning criticising you over the environment. What's your reaction and do you ask him to apologise over his comments on the Privileges Committee? Thank you, Hugh. A look, quick, quickly on Lord Goldsmith, he was asked to apologise for his comments about the Privileges Committee because I felt that those were incompatible with his position in, as a minister. He's obviously chosen to take a different course. Uh, I accept that. I'm proud of the record of this government and indeed of Zach in government. 
making sure that we tackle climate change and protect our natural environment. I think the UK has played a leadership role globally and we will continue to do so uh, as, uh, as you will see. Uh, now, on, on your question about the plan, I think that you've, you've heard how Amanda and Steve and numerous other healthcare bodies have described it today. Landmark, historic, momentous, important. First time it's happened in 75 years. So it was important that we got it right because this is a really important day and this sets the NHS up for decades to come. So taking the time to get it right is absolutely the correct course of action. And I think as you'll be able to see from the plan today, it's very comprehensive. Uh, there are three strands to it. It's not just about training more doctors and nurses. Of course, that's important and everyone knows we need to do that and we're doing that. But the two other strands are also important about how do we retain our fantastic NHS workers, something Amanda might be able to touch on in a second. But you know we know we need to do a better job of that, and we've got a clear set of uh, initiatives and proposals that will do that. But then also reform, because I know everyone wants to know that the government is backing the NHS with funding, and we're doing that. Record sums that have been put in by me, the Chancellor, uh, and, and Steve, the Health Secretary. But we also want to make sure that money is well spent and that the NHS is modernized so it is fit for the future to deliver the care that we all need and do so in a way that is keeping up with how healthcare is changing. So look, three strands, train, retain, and reform. This is a historic moment, it's an important moment. This will set the NHS up for years, if not decades into the future. So I don't make any apology about taking the time to get it right. And I think as you can see from the reception, it's a plan that will be warmly welcomed and make an enormous difference to the country and indeed the NHS and the incredible people that work for it. I don't know, Amanda, do you want to touch on the, sort of the retention bit perhaps or what, you know, the things that we've been working on? Very happy to talk a bit about retention because I guess that goes slightly to your question, Hugh, about so you know the the time that it's going to take clearly to uh, recruit to retain, to train some of the the staff uh, that we're describing. But um, I think the retention actions clearly are for today. They're for now. So two really big things that it's worth mentioning. One is we know flexibility really matters to our staff. So partly that's been addressed through some of the pension reforms, but we've recently announced initiatives like enabling doctors who might be considering retiring to continue to uh, work more flexibly for the NHS because we'd rather have some of their time than none of their time. Uh, so a range of things that will support people, particularly with flexibility around career end. The second thing we know really matters is career progression. So part of this plan, of course, is about more of those sorts of roles that we know can bring people into the NHS, nurse associates, uh, we've talked about already, but also opportunities then for those people to progress through. So whether that's nurse associates becoming qualified nurses, becoming then advanced practitioners, or in a range of other ways, you know, that's, that's the other big component. But I think what Steve would say on retention, and this is another, I think, important point about why the long-term sustainability matters so much, is when you are working in the NHS, in fact, we were talking about it as we were coming over today, and you turn up on a shift and it's you know, people you're not familiar with working with, there are gaps in the rotors, you know, that makes it really hard for people to feel they can do their best work looking after patients. So knowing that in time we will get to a place where we have a sustainable workforce solution also matters for staff who are working with us today. I think just quickly before we move on about the time that we've been spending to get this right, and Steve maybe can spend 30 seconds on it, is we also wanted to engage and listen to people Right. This wasn't a plan that you know, Amanda and Steve just concocted in their office and then sat down with Steve and me and the Chancellor to put together. This, what we've been doing with the time is talking to, I, I think, something like 60-odd organisations and 100-odd experts in the healthcare field. And S Steve can speak to that because he's been doing a lot of that engagement. And um, We chaired a roundtable just here in Downing Street earlier this week because we wanted to make sure that we heard from everyone involved in the NHS and that we got all their ideas on board. We discussed with them what they were looking for, what, what were the things that would make the most difference, and make sure that we do this together. Because ultimately, I can stand here and announce this. You know, Amanda and Steve are here with me, and as we discussed with everyone else earlier this week, this is a plan that will ultimately need to be delivered by all the incredible people working and leading the NHS. So it's important that they were part of this journey and that the plan is as much theirs as it is hours but see i mean you've yeah, been doing that, that for months very, so that's an incredibly important point because part of the reason it's taken time is because we really wanted to engage with all the people that we work for so 
Jeanette is sitting uh, in the audience today, the upcoming chairman of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges and the medical royal colleges in the medical space have been working closely with us, but also professional bodies throughout all the professions uh, in the NHS. Uh, what struck me at the round table that was held here um, earlier this week was just the positivity uh, from all those representatives of all those key uh, bodies that were, were in the room. Uh, they were up for the challenge. Uh, they recognise that this is rightly a challenging plan, uh, both in terms of numbers uh, and both in terms of the reform that needs to happen. Uh, but they were up for it. I've been talking to leaders of universities, the university leaders who were in the room as well uh, earlier this week, to the GMC, who's a regulator for, on the medical workforce, uh, on, 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 on the ambition to shorten the curriculum uh, for medical students, to introduce apprenticeships, to widen uh, the access for people coming into medical schools. They are really up for it. Yes, it's going to be challenging. Uh, over the five-year period where the, uh, uh, the 2.4 billion is targeted, that is around the time scale it will take to build the new medical schools to put the additional places uh, in, uh, in the system. But uh, it's a challenge, but people, people are absolutely uh, up for it, and it is entirely doable. Thank you. Right, we'll turn to ITV next. On ITV News, uh, there's lots of new money in here, Prime Minister, for training, but not new money for pay. And yet we've had former NHS workers tell us that one of the reasons they left was below inflation pay rises. I just wanted to ask you, do you accept that pay hits morale in the NHS? And also, this is in the long term, what will it mean for patients who are on waiting lists now? And to Amanda Pritchard and to Steve Powers, can I just ask you about a short-term workforce challenge you're facing? How worried are you about doctor's strikes next month, and do you want to see the government do more to stop them? An Anushka, on, look, of, you asked about pay. Look, of course, would everyone like to be paid more? Of course they would be. But I think everyone also recognises the economic context that we're in. And our job in government is to balance all those things, make sure that we reward people fairly, and well for the incredible work they're doing, particularly our NHS workers, but also make sure that we're doing things that are good for them and the rest of the country in the long term, and that means bringing down inflation, because it won't help anybody if we just take the easy course and ultimately make the situation worse and last longer. And actually, I'm really pleased that the NHS Staff Council, which represents over half a dozen unions, over a million NHS workers, actually voted to accept the government's pay offer because I think they did recognise that it was fair and reasonable, rewarded their members for their hard work. And I'm very grateful to all of them for doing that, because I know that fundamentally what they care about is working really hard to deliver excellent health care. We wanted to reward that, the 5% pay rise for this forthcoming year, together with one-off bonuses of up to £2,000. That money is going to be hitting people's pay packets literally in the next months it will start making a real difference to people um, but it is important that we balance all these considerations and we'll continue to do so but also it's the, the reason we can do this today is because we in government prioritize we prioritize the things that are really important no government can do absolutely everything of course they can't and particularly not in the economic circumstances that we face now that'd be enormously counterproductive but this is something that you know the chancellor and i have known that we wanted to do for a long time in fact Jeremy wrote a book about this some years ago. And so we've always known we wanted to do this, and we've made sure that in all our thinking and all our financial planning that we would be able to fund this uh, because we knew that this was the right thing to do, and it was the country's number one priority. It was our priority to put the NHS on a secure footing for the long term, to do the difficult thing that no other government has done before. That's what we've done today. But that does involve looking in the round and prioritising, and, and that's what we've done. Um, and I think, I mean, you, you should talk to Amanda and Steve, but you, you talked about, Amanda's already talked about retention. That there are many reasons that go into how can we improve retention in the NHS. I won't repeat everything Amanda says, but we are investing in lots of them. I mean, I think actually I was just talking to people this morning when I was out in Cambridgeshire at the hospital there. Something that's valuable to them is the training support they get after they start work, and that's something that we've done, right? So we've introduced a £1,000 training budget for nurses, midwives. Once they qualify, they get access to a training budget to continue, to support, continue supporting them in their career. So there are other ways that we can support people alongside pay. Um, but, and on the, on the workforce challenges of today, obviously you should hear from Amanda and Steve, but of course it is challenging when people take industrial action. We've already had over half a million patients' care disrupted as a result of industrial action. I don't want to see that. I'm sure Amanda and Steve don't want to see that. So, you know, I'd ask everyone to 
recognize the economic context that we're in. And as I said, I'm very grateful to the NHS Staff Council and the over a million workers they represent for accepting the government's pay deal uh, and working with us to, to deliver great quality care. Is there anything you want to add, Amanda? Uh, pro probably not a, not a great deal, but I think it is worth just really taking a moment to acknowledge the level of pressure that our colleagues in the NHS are under. Um, enormous demands, both from kind of COVID backlogs as well as uh, as well as everyday pressures. So. I think that is why it is so important that we do have a long-term plan that gives uh, a clear kind of blueprint to get to a place where we will have a more sustainable, in fact, a sustainable staffing position within the NHS, because we know how much that matters to staff now, as well as how much that matters for us being able to provide the care that we need to provide for patients in the future as well. Short term, and we've talked a lot about the retention aspect of the plan already. Uh, there's a lot more detail behind it uh, that we could certainly talk about, but I think we're very conscious that uh, it is really important that, you know, my job, it's it's not my job to deal with the issues of pay, that's between government and the unions, but it is my job to make sure that we are doing everything we can to support patient, to support our staff uh, to be able to uh, work uh, in a way that feels well supported, where they've got the flexibility that works for them and works for patients, where they've got the career development that we know matters for them, and that's why that's such a big part of the plan. Thanks. I think, Steve, anything to add yeah, on? Yes, just simply on planning for strikes, and I'm aware that there are more strikes planned for, for next month. Uh, we will be doing what we've been doing throughout. Our job, Amanda and, and our colleagues in NHS, our job is to prepare for those strikes to ensure that we keep patients safe, that we keep those services going, that we can keep going. Of course, we'll be focusing on making sure emergency services, maternity services, trauma service, those key services uh, are kept uh, intact and running as normal and as safe. Uh, and safe. Uh, we will be, of course, keeping channels open with the unions to uh, flag to them uh, anything that we are worried about and we expect them uh, to respond positively uh, if we do that. Uh, so we will be doing that. Of course, uh, we want to support our staff, uh, whether they're striking or not. And of course, uh, all of us would like to see these dis disputes resolved. And as the Prime Minister has said, some of those disputes have been resolved over the course of the year. And even for senior doctors, if you go back to earlier this year, uh, when the BMA set out what they wanted uh, to see, uh, one of the three things was on pensions reform. And of course, pensions reform uh, has been delivered and that now is off the table as an issue. So, you know, I have to remain, I always will, will remain optimistic that we can make progress. But what we're talking about today is, is both in the short term and, and in the long term, putting in place the conditions that mean job satisfaction uh, and getting people uh, enjoying work and wanting to come uh, uh, to work uh, is, is, is there uh, every day, uh, every week in the NHS. Uh, and putting in more resilience because it has been a really tough time, as Amanda has said, particularly over the pandemic. I'd, I'd just add, I mean, I, I sit down with Steve, Amanda and, and Steve and others almost every week. And in spite of the industrial action, we are still making progress on cutting the waiting list. Right? And that's that, you know, down to the extraordinary efforts of everyone involved. That if you look at waiting lists, we've, as I said, virtually eliminated uh, one and a half year waiters. Uh, we've eliminated two year waiters last year. Look at A&E and ambulance times, strong recovery from winter we're rolling out virtual wards more hospital um, surgical hubs to do elective surgery more community diagnostic centers more use of virtual wards that all those things are making a difference right now uh, and improving people's experience with the nhs improving their care and we're managing to do that in spite of the industrial action and that's thanks to an enormous amount of hard work from a lot of people and that is when i said we put record funding in weeks after i became prime minister we're using that funding to good effect uh, next gb news Catherine Forster, GB News. Obviously, a huge amount to be welcomed in these plans. But in the short term, you've got cut waiting lists emblazoned across all the podiums. Currently, you've got a record 7.4 million people on waiting lists. You've got junior doctors going to strike for five days, also consultants. You spent last year saying, we'll go with whatever the independent pay review body recommends. Now you're not guaranteeing that you'll do even that. Are you confident that you can deliver on this priority and all of your five priorities in a significant way before the next election? The simple answer is yes, I am. And uh, that's why I set them out very clearly at the beginning of the year. Actually unusual, and it's great that everyone's talking about them because I think it's right 
that leaders and politicians set very clear objectives, make it crystal clear to the country what they're trying to achieve so that I and everyone else can be held accountable for them. Uh, and it's good that they're transparent and everyone can understand what we're about. And we are making progress uh, in spite of the challenges that we face. We are doing things that are improving people's experience of patient care right now. I, as I said, for their sins, Amanda and Steve have to come and see me all the time, and we go through this on a very regular basis together with Steve. But let's just talk. Let's talk about urgent and emergency care. Everyone remembers how challenging that was over the winter. You know, we have an urgent emergency care recovery plan. It involves more doctors, more nurses, more ambulances, uh, then also more use of faster discharge and virtual wards. Look, all of those things are helping us improve our urgent and emergency care performance. Ambulance waiting times that were one and a half hours, cat two, over winter, down to around about half an hour, and we're making good progress. A&E waiting times around, you know, they were 65% four hours uh, at the worst point, now up a, a close to 75%. You know, virtual ward Steve is doing a good job of rolling out across the country. What does that mean? Stops people from coming into hospital in the first place, gets them home quicker, once they're there, better patient care for them, improves the flow through the hospital. The money that we've put into social care, helping us discharge people quicker out of hospitals because they should be at home and need to be at home, that also helps. So the, I, the money that we've put in, that the Chancellor put in, as I said, weeks after I took office, is making a real difference. It's making a real difference right now to people. And is industrial action challenging? Of course it's challenging. Does it make everything harder? Of course it does. But we are still making progress. And in terms of the backlogs, we always knew that they would continue to grow. Right? There's the bounce back from COVID that we knew would happen. That was always forecast to happen. But in spite of that, we're eliminating steadily but surely the people who are waiting a very long time. Just recently, we made a significant announcement to give people choice about where they get their treatment. So from now on, when you get referred for further treatment from your GP, you'll be able to use the website or your app to select from different providers and in doing so, you'll be able to cut your waiting times because we know, and the research is very clear, that actually, once you give that choice to people and they have the option of choosing a different hospital, it can cut waiting times by around three months. Uh, and that's something that we are now in the process of rolling out. And later this year, that choice will be extended to people who are already on waiting lists, and that will help us bring the waiting list down even further. So look, those are all examples of things we're doing right now that will make a big difference to people, and that's why I'm confident we will continue to make progress and people will continue to see their improvement of the NHS at all levels. Urgent and emergency care, elective and outpatients, all primary care will just continue to improve. That's what we're all dedicated to deliver and, and I'm confident that we will. Uh, Telegraph. Daniel Martin of Telegraph. Uh, many people find it very hard to get an NHS dentist. Do you think that um, the more dentists should work in the NHS and is there anything in the plan which would help achieve that? Uh, the simple answer is yes and yes. So we, the, the plan has an increase in dentistry training places. Steve might want to talk about that in a little bit more detail, perhaps. Um, but that's in the plan as well. And that we are aware of the challenges in NHS dentistry. Uh, we've obviously reformed the dentistry contracts. That's something we've done recently. We're allowing some dentists that are high performing to do up to 10% more than their contracted amounts. There are more dentists in the NHS today, hundreds, uh, than there were previously. And we're seeing far more children now through NHS dentistry than we were a year before. But I know that there are challenges. The long-term workforce plan will help us fix those over time. And the other thing that we are exploring is uh, the, the possibility of introducing a what's called a tie-in for dentistry. I mean, around about two-thirds of uh, dentists, after they finish their uh, specialty training, end up not uh, doing work in the NHS, uh, that's something that we want to look at and it may be that the appropriate thing to do is to introduce a tie so that people are performing more NHS work after they qualify. Of course, they've benefited from a very significant subsidy from the taxpayer worth hundreds of thousands of pounds, so that seems a reasonable approach. That's something we're going to explore, but we are also funding an expansion of dental training places. I don't know if Steve or Amanda anything you want to add on that. Well, it's exactly that. We are. Uh uh, in the plan, there is a plan to expand dental training places as well, and also uh, allied professions to dentistry as well. Uh, so that will put more capacity and more dentists uh, into the system over time as well. Uh, the tie-in, uh, Prime Minister talked about, that's something that we're considering as well. Uh, but of course, there are wider uh, issues around uh, access to dentistry, and so we are working collectively with Secretary of State uh, and others uh, around a dental uh, recovery plan as well. So um, I guess more to come on that.
I, you know, I think I, we talked about this reform piece, and we haven't talked about it very much actually in the Q and A. But one of the examples of reform is uh, in dentistry, where we can have you know, people who are not dentists but are in as are the allied health professionals, where it's um, uh, I think what they call therapists or dental, you know, one of the roles where we expect them to do more dental work going forward than they've done in the past, and that's one of the regulatory changes that we're looking at making. Again, it's an example of us doing things differently, modernizing the health service, but we want everyone to be operating at the top of their license, right? So the people who have got the full brand spanking degree should focus on the things that only they can do, and where we can find different roles, create new roles, change how we regulate to allow other people to perform other tasks that they are capable of doing, that's what we should be doing. That will improve healthcare for all of us and make a more productive healthcare system, and actually we're doing that in dentistry as well as doing it everywhere else. Okay, next, Daily Mail. Thanks, Jim. Um, one for the medics. Uh, you've got um, uh, patient satisfaction at a record low. This is obviously a long-term plan. Realistically, uh, will people start to notice any difference within the next 12 months? Uh, or given that you've got strikes going on left, right and centre, might uh, mm -hmm. people have to accept that things will get uh, worse before they get better? Uh, and PM, can I ask you about uh, yesterday's appeal court judgment? Um, are you confident that you can win in the Supreme Court? Are you surprised to find the uh, UNHCR arguing against you when it sends people there itself? And will we finally get the first flight in the air this year? Do you guys want to take the first one and then I'll... Yeah, I'm happy to kick off on that one. So thank you. So I think your question about will, will patients notice a difference? Well, so everything we are doing is, of course, geared towards making things better for patients, as well as making sure that our staff have really rewarding careers and they have enough people with the right skills to enable them to look after their patients the way we know they want to. So the things that will make a difference immediately, we've talked about some of the really important things on retention. Some of the new roles that we've talked about, uh, Prime Minister just mentioned reform, some of the new roles and the increases in those roles will come on stream much more quickly because the training periods are obviously uh, are, are reduced. Um, so I think there is a lot in this plan that speaks to today, as well as the confidence it can give our current staff about the fact that we will get to a place where we have a sustainable staffing model in the longer term. On the range of things, though, outside just the workforce plan, I think the Prime Minister has actually just given a pretty comprehensive <laughs> run through of many of the things that we are doing, which are all about making sure that we are making an impact as we already are, whether that is on reducing the number of people who are waiting, as we say, virtually eliminated now two year waits, over 90% reduction in 18 month waits and we're now focused on 65 weeks is the next uh, big target on that or it's about the work that we're doing to improve ambulance response times a and e performance both of which have uh, sustainably and significantly improved since winter or it's the work we're doing on increasing the number of people getting cancer checks record levels uh, which is leading to record numbers of people being diagnosed at stage one and stage two and actually we're seeing that impact now on survival rates which is ultimately you know the the, the big goal there so whether you're looking at any of those things or indeed primary care, where we've recently launched a primary care access recovery plan, which has a range of things in that to support incredibly hardworking colleagues in primary care through things and Secretary of State uh, has been working very closely with us on all of this, looking at where we can use things like technology to really make things better, not just for patients, easier for them, but better and easier for our staff too. So I would, I would very much hope that uh, patients will already see the benefit of the work that we've been doing on those sorts of things, but certainly a lot more to come. Can I just uh, emphasise something, sorry, before Steve comes in, that Amanda said, I think it's really important and probably not well understood. Right now, the NHS is doing more, treating more people, seeing more people, diagnosing more people, scanning more people than it has ever done. Right, so because of the investment that we've put in and because of the innovations in how we're doing things, all the, whether it's virtual wards or community diagnostic centers or elective surgical hubs, whatever it might be, all the new ways we're doing things and the funding, the NHS is doing more than it's ever done. Right, so yes, do we, of course, we have a challenge that people are, are waiting longer than we'd like. Yes, we know why that is. It's because we have a massive backlog that built up over two years of COVID where we were not able to see everyone and we always knew that would be the case. But people should be reassured that because of the investment and the hard work and the innovations, right now, thousands and thousands of people every day are being seen who would not have otherwise been seen, and that's because of the extra 
um, as I said, funding resources, innovations that we're, we're putting in. Um, so yes, we will get, that's why I'm confident we will get there. And the trajectory for all those things is up, right? We have plans for all of these things to just keep increasing the amount of activity that the NHS can do. Uh, and that's how we will ultimately bring all these waiting lists down. Steve, anything you want to add? Well, well you mentioned stage. surveys, and, and when we look at surveys and when, what we, when we hear what people tell us, what they tell us is that they very firmly believe in the principles of the NHS, in the NHS as it, as it, uh, as it is set up as a, a delivery uh, model for, for healthcare. Uh, they tell us that when they get care, they're very satisfied, but what they're frustrated at is access to care, whether it's in general practice, you mentioned dentistry, uh, and of course getting people to urgent emergency care services quickly as well. And that's why that has been the focus of the plans that we have published with the government uh, this year. And a very, very specific example that Amanda touched on, which is in general practice, where we know again that, that the levels of satisfaction are high when you see somebody in primary care, when you see a healthcare professional, a GP or other, uh, other clinician, uh, but there's a frustration in getting through that 8 a.m. Uh, you know, uh, log jam on a Monday morning. Uh, cloud telephony, uh, which sounds a really simple thing, uh, you know, technology that is used in other industries, people will be familiar with, but it's actually transformational. And if you go and stand for a morning or visit for a morning a surgery where they have implemented it, what you see uh, is behind the scenes a practice that is that is giving access to people on the day, that is sorting the problems, uh, who, are, who are able to call back automatically rather than people hanging on, who are able to know how many people are waiting and therefore divert staff uh, in order to uh, deal with the pressures at a particular time of day, uh, who have got their processes sorted uh, behind the scenes to ensure that the patient gets to the right clinician. That might be a phone call, it might be a digital consultation, it might be a face-to-face -face, uh, appointment at a time that the patient uh, uh, is convenient to the patient. Uh, and, and that is the future of primary care. And when you see it in action, uh, it is really, really quite, quite transformational and incredibly impressive. So, so the plan is to use technology and to use this workforce plan and the other plans that we've got to make sure that happens everywhere, not just somewhere. And that's exactly what we aim to do. And just on, on Steve's point on primary care, which is exactly right and very well made, what are we doing? We're providing grants for thousands of GP practices so that they can switch to the system that Steve just described that is so much better for patients. So we are saying to GP practices, sign up, we're gonna give you a grant so that you can install that cloud-based telephony system, get the training, by the way, that you also need for your teams and support you while you do the transition. There's now a grant available from us. We funded that because we think that will make a big difference to people's experience of accessing their GP by moving to that new technology. And what are one of the other things we're doing? We're changing how pharmacies work, moving to a pharmacy first model where this winter you will be able to go to your pharmacist and for seven common ailments like ear infections, sore throat, sinusitis, UTIs and other things, the pharmacist will be able to give you the medicines that you need. Right? That is an example of us doing something differently as well as expanding more blood pressure checks and indeed oral contraception in pharmacies. That again means that people will be able to get access to healthcare quicker, relieve some of the pressure on GPs. And to Amanda's point, these are the types of examples of things that are making a difference in the here and now. Um, and on your other question, Jason, look, I, I respect the court, but I fundamentally disagree with their conclusions. You know, I strongly believe, and the Lord Chief Justice made clear that he agrees with this as well, that the Rwandans have provided all the assurances necessary to ensure that there is no real risk that asylum seekers that are relocated under our policy would be wrongly returned to third countries. You know, Rwanda is a safe country. The High Court agrees with that. And indeed, you mentioned the UNHCR. They use Rwanda for their own refugee scheme for Libyan refugees. And given all of that, we're going to seek permission to appeal this decision to the Supreme Court. And I've said it before from here, I'll say it again, the policy of this government is very simple. It is your government and it is not uh, criminal gangs who should decide who comes here. Right? It is a very simple point of view. It is our country, it is our government who should decide who comes here, not criminal gangs. And I'll do what is necessary to make sure that that happens. Uh, I said that, well, there's a matter for the courts in terms of their timeline. Um, next, we go? I know we're running out of time, so let's try and wrap through a couple more. The Sun. Um, we know that thousands of doctors are fleeing to Australia to go and take advantage of their really lucrative system and really good pay and offers and conditions that they've got over there. Um, obviously, after training in the NHS for many, many years, um, obviously at the taxpayer's expense, do you not, guys not think that there should be some form of mandatory training to keep those doctors in the NHS for longer? 
And just on Rwanda, if I may, what is your plan B for those Tory MPs who are saying this plan just might not work, it might not take off the ground? And how are those talks going with other countries to put in similar deals if this plan doesn't come through? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll do quickly both of those. Uh, look, I'll, on your first point, look, I read all those reports as well, and I was concerned. Health Secretary was concerned. Uh, we sat down and we went through it all together. Actually, we just went and looked through the data. And the data shows that, that it is not as widespread a practice as I think people assume it is. And clearly, if it was, we would look to do something. And that's why with dentistry, as we've touched on before, where we think there is a potential issue there, we are exploring, uh, as you mentioned, the possibility of introducing a dental tie-in. But when it comes to doctors, and Steve might have better numbers than me, but it was around, I think, 95% of people who, after they completed their foundation training, were still working in the NHS. So the, I think the scale of what is happening is not uh, at the level that people commonly assume it is. And for that reason, we didn't think it was the right approach. But as I said, if we think there is an issue, we are prepared to take action. And you're seeing that uh, with dentistry, where we're contemplating whether it does make sense to introduce the tie. And on, uh, on Rwanda, you know, I'm just going to repeat what I said before, that we are confident in our case. Right? The High Court agreed with us. The Lord Chief Justice agreed with us. You know, R Rwanda, Rwanda doesn't even have returns agreements with other countries, and they've provided uh, a set of safeguards and assurances to us about the treatment of uh, refugees that will be sent there that we believe are strong. Uh, and I said the High Court and the Lord Chief Justice agreed with that. So we will seek permission to appeal this case to the Supreme Court, and we remain entirely confident that what we're doing is right. Uh, and it is also fair, because there is nothing moral or compassionate by allowing the current system to continue. Right? People are just needlessly dying as they try and make these crossings. They are exploited by criminal gangs. You spend any time with the people who are actually, as I've done, in the channel, picking people up, seeing the conditions that they are subject to, seeing what children are subject to, would find it very hard to justify maintaining this system. And this will always be a compassionate and tolerant country. We have welcomed almost half a million people here from all different parts of the world over the last few years. We will continue to do that, but we want to make sure that that compassion is targeted on the people who most need our help and that our generosity is not exploited by gangs. And that is what our policy will seek uh, to do. And you talk about other deals. You, know, we, you can already see some signs of progress there with the cooperation that we're having with the French, uh, but also Albania, where our new returns agreement and the new approach to dealing with illegal migrants from Albania means that we have reduced the numbers by around 90% so far since that deal was signed and we've returned almost 2,000 illegal migrants to Albania. So that, to me, shows that deterrence works. So when you can have a system where people know that if they come here illegally, they won't be allowed to stay, they will be returned, they stop coming. Uh, and that's the policy that we want to roll out more broadly. Um, great. Last one from The Times. This one from The Times. Uh, just one quick point of clarification first about the breakdown of this uh, 2.4 billion. How much of that is year one, year two, year three, year four, year five? So you can just see how that splits out. And then uh, on productivity, um, Amanda Pritchard and Professor Powers, you're both pretty clear in this plan that you think the productivity targets in here can only be hit if there is more money available for buildings and technology. Have you put a figure on that? And are you saying that these targets can't be hit unless there is more investment in those areas? And, and Prime Minister, I mean, you, you point out rightly that you know, the, the NHS has more staff, more money than before, yet, yet productivity has fallen. Why do you think that is? And do you agree with those who say it can't, that can't be reversed unless we spend more than we do now on beds building and technology? No, so, uh, you know, wh why has productivity fallen? Well, you know, we had a two year pandemic that impacted the NHS quite considerably and impacted how it had to work within in, uh, infection prevention controls and lots of other measures that had to be introduced. So, look, of course productivity took a hit uh, whilst that was going on. But what I'm confident about now is that productivity will increase. It will increase because not just that we're putting in more funding, record funding in fact, but we're doing things differently. Right? We talked about virtual wards. We talked about 
surgical hubs, we talked about community diagnostic centers. All of those are examples of how we can do more with the resources that we have by being clever, by thinking innovatively, by learning from best practice elsewhere and rolling that out across the system. And Steve could talk to you in detail about any one of those things, but elective surgical hubs, which mean that we protect outpatient or surgical capacity away from the acute centers, that's good for productivity. Community diagnostic centers just improve our ability to maintain diagnostics, particularly for cancer, as Amanda mentioned, that's improving our productivity. Activity. Where are we using AI as well? Talk to you know radiologists and radiographers now, particularly in dermatology, how they're using AI to save them time, diagnose things, spot things, uh, and and mean, uh, mean that they can spend more time doing more things. That's increasing productivity as we speak. And then all the measures about reform in this plan, the new roles that we're creating: nurse associates, physician associates, um, uh, anesthesia associates. Those are the types of examples of things that will improve productivity, which is why I think we are confident that we can grow it over time. And it's right that we do, because I, I want to make sure the NHS is fully funded. I believe in the NHS. That's why the government has put record funding in. But I also think it's right that for taxpayers, we perform as productively as we can. And I think that's what people want to see, right? Everyone is happy to fund the NHS, but they want to make sure that it is delivering at the best of its capability. And that was something that was very important to me as we the plan was put together um, and it is the most ambitious set of reforms I think probably in the NHS history when it comes to how we recruit train uh, people and how they work and that's what gives all of us confidence that we can drive up productivity over time uh, and quickly on, on capital look, there's record sums of capital going into the NHS you can see that for example in CDCs being a good example where we're well on our way to getting 100 and 80 or 90 odd of those, uh, I think, done. Um, and, and hospital upgrades everywhere, and as you know, the Fortin new hospital program. So look, there's record sums of capital going in, and there will continue to be strong financial support for the NHS. Thank you. Um, so I think it's probably worth saying, you know, everything that this plan is about, as I've said before, is about making sure that we have the workforce that we need for the long term to deliver for our patients. And we absolutely recognise the level of pressure on our staff at the moment, but also just the challenge that the pandemic has left us with and some of the things that were pre-pandemic as well. So you know, this is not a kind of overnight magic one solution. What this is, is a set of things that are going to make a difference now in the medium term and in the long term to get us uh, to that position uh, and to continue to make progress. But on your point about productivity, I think, again, just really important for, to say this is not about people working harder. And I think that's uh, absolutely critical. This is about people working differently. So three things, Prime Minister's already called them out. This is going to be uh, absolutely recognising the way that we're changing the way we provide services. So more in the community, more done with remotely, uh, the ability to shift care out of hospitals. Great if you need to be in a hospital, but if you don't, and we can do it better by helping people to get the care they need out of hospital. That's what we want to do, and that's written through the plan. Secondly, it's about new roles. And again, we've talked about some of those already, but that's uh, part of creating the right mix of skills for teams so that they can deliver for patients uh, as effectively as possible. Um, but it is also going to be about continuing to see investment as we have in uh, digital, in uh, uh, technology, and of course, in the physical estate as well. Steve, anything on your well, mind? Uh, yeah, only to echo that. I think there is a great opportunity in the technology that we are seeing now, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, to drive productivity. We've seen productivity gains in the past by things such as reducing length of stay. Uh, and that, of course, has been harder over the period of the pandemic. Uh, but robotics, for instance, uh, allow patients to go home earlier uh, uh, post-operation. Uh, so um, uh, radiology, um, you know, Jeanette, I mentioned already, who's here from the Academy, was previous president of the Royal College of Radiologists. And we're working very closely with the radiologists, in, or radiologists on imaging and how artificial intelligence can be used in imaging. For instance, in strokes, uh, if you have a potential acute stroke, the diagnosis now is aided through artificial intelligence, uh, also uh, helping the radiologists in terms of imaging. So I think you will see much, much more of this going forward, and there's a real opportunity uh, in clinical areas, also in non-clinical areas as well, just in administration and automated processes to drive those productivity gains. So yes, it is an important thing. Perfect. Um, just in conclusion, I would just say this is an incredibly important day for the NHS and for the country. And, uh, you know, you, all of you have seen the comments from different stakeholders, and it's rare that people use words like historic and momentous uh, to describe something that government and organisations do. But I think 
those are the right words to use to describe what is happening today because for 75 years the NHS has not had a long-term workforce plan and for the first time it will uh, and it's right that everyone takes a moment to recognize the significance of that moment and I want to put on record my thanks particularly to the Chancellor and the Health Secretary but Stephen and Amanda and all the m many many people who have helped feed in to this plan uh, because that's what it takes for us to deliver this. I said that earlier on, but I really meant it. Right, there are over a million people that work in the NHS, but all the people who are involved in implementing this plan now have a responsibility and a joint collective effort with all of us to deliver the incredible things that this plan is capable of doing. And if we can do that, then we can do something incredibly special for the country and for all the incredible people in the NHS and deliver a healthcare system that is completely fit for the future for years, if not decades to come, providing a modernized health service that is effective, that gets people the care they need when they need it, in the way that they need it. Uh, and as I said, it's an example of this government doing difficult long-term things that are the right thing for the country. It's probably one of the most significant things I'll do as prime minister. It, it's a real personal moment of pride for me to be able to support this plan because as I said I think it's what the country and the NHS needs and I'm glad that we could do it. Thank you very much.